All right, stop me if you've heard this one before, but what do you call an elf who's undead and also completely invisible except for its hands and eyes, aside from right after when it kills another creature and then reveals its true dark skeletal nature only to return to the protection of the void moments later and keep you guessing as to the true nature of its being? Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of D&D or other related, semi-related folkloric stuff and bring them to 5th edition Dungeons and & Dragons and make conversions of them so you can use them in your own homebrew D&D game. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're going to be talking about a creature from the wonderful world of Dragonlance. This creature is not only extremely goofy looking, but it's actually really cool, and I promise if you just bear with me, you will see how interesting this creature can be. The Witchlin, at first glance, appears to be nothing more than a floating set of eyeballs accompanied by an equally silly and disturbing set of floating skeletal hands. However, having a random T in the middle of their name that most definitely does not need to be there isn't the only thing the hands and eyes are good at. The Witchlin is an undead creature created by an elvish god of death or some other equally powerful entity when said entity placed a curse upon the peoples of an elvish kingdom. Now, being a creature from an established setting, like Dragonlance, means that it has some ties with that world's cosmology and history, which can be really cool if you're running a game in Dragonlance, but for general purposes, you don't really need to dig too much beyond that. These undead creatures are essentially the remnants of a tragically cursed elvish people. The new Witchlin are created by that same evil entity whenever an evil aligned elf dies, there's a chance that its soul might be brought back as a Witchlin to serve this dark god. Or, if a Witchlin kills another elf that is not yet undead, it will then also be raised as a Witchlin. Now, there is a bit more than meets the disembodied eyes with this creature. Anyone who has true sight or some kind of ability to see ghosts or anything that's magical that would normally be hidden from the regular naked eye of your average person is going to be able to see the Witchlin for what they truly are. So, the rest of their body didn't disappear. It's simply incorporeal and invisible. The true form of the Witchlin is actually that of a blackened elvish skeleton that might have some remnants of rotting flesh still on it. It just so happens that the only parts that we can see are the eyes and hands. Now why the entity that originally created the first Witchlin chose for them to have this extremely unfortunate and almost comical form is beyond me, but perhaps that in and of itself is part of the curse. Not only are you undead, but people are going to think you look stupid. Seems like something more in line with a trickster god than a malevolent god of death, but I digress. So today we're going to take some time and talk about just exactly what these creatures can do in battle. A few changes I've made to the base creature to kind of give them a fresh coat of paint for D&D 5th edition. And of course, we're going to talk about some plot hooks and general ways you might want to use this creature just as an easy encounter or for an actually more involved story role with your game. But in either case, let's not get ahead of ourselves. First things first, we're going to talk about some. So for starters, the first thing I want to talk about is tactics. The Witchlin is extremely intelligent in the way it goes about doing battle. It knows that it's mostly invisible. So it's absolutely going to capitalize on that as much as it possibly can. An ideal fight for this creature is not revealing itself until the very last possible moment because it needs to get in close to do a real amount of damage. And if it can do that without being detected, then that's exactly the situation it wants to be in. As far as actually dealing damage goes, it has two primary attacks, one for each of its hands. Its first hand has an attack called Hand of Pestilence, which causes a pretty significant amount of poison damage, forces the target to make a saving throw, and if they fail that save, not only do they take that poison damage, but then they are also themselves poisoned. It always wants to open up with this attack if it can, because if it's able to poison the target, that means the target will then be rolling its saving throws with disadvantage, which means that its follow-up ability using its other hand, the Hand of Fear, is going to be much more powerful. Now the second ability that it can use with its other hand is where this creature starts to get really interesting. The Hand of Fear allows it to paralyze a creature. It doesn't actually cause any damage, but it can force a creature to make a saving throw, and if it fails that save, that creature is then paralyzed. This is pretty run-of-the-mill fare for a creature of CR4+. Plus. They usually have some kind of fantastical abilities. It has one that causes damage, and one that is going to be like a status effect, in this case paralysis. However, where this becomes really fascinating is that that Hand of Fear ability 
has a second line of text. If it uses this ability to try to paralyze anyone of elven heritage, so any of your elves, dro, wood elf, whatever, as well as half elves, it also gets to cast suggestion on that creature for free. So not only is the creature paralyzed, but this elvish undead abomination is able to like whisper commands or ideas into that creature's head that may or may not take root depending on how they do with their save against the spell suggestion. Now the reason this is so fascinating to me is because this is one of the rare cases where we can kind of add intense roleplay via mechanics in a battle. Now for those who are not aware, Suggestion is an enchantment spell. It's kind of like Dominate Monster, except not quite as potent. It's only second level, so it doesn't allow you to just assume direct control of that creature. But it allows you to make a suggestion to them. As, and as long as it's worded in such a way where it sounds like it's semi-reasonable, the creature is obligated to comply. Of course, the caveat being, as with many of these domination type spells, it can't be something self-harmful to the creature. So you're not going to be able to convince someone to turn on their traveling companions and start attacking the other party members, but you might be able to convince them to just sit down or set their weapon on the ground or just walk away. Just do something that's essentially going to make the party's life more difficult, but not something that's so crazy as getting your elvish wizard to suddenly cast fireball on the rest of his friends. And this is one of the reasons why I feel like this creature wouldn't be printed in a book today because it is extremely unbalanced. Not in the sense where this creature is overly powerful, but it singles out a specific party member and in a way kind of punishes them for a choice that has nothing to do with this encounter that's totally outside of their control. It's one thing for a creature to use an ability to punish a character who has done something to trigger this ability, but in this case, if you're an elf, you just get extra things thrown at you for no other reason aside from the fact that you chose one of the elf sub-races as your character race. So it's really easy to see where that would be considered kind of unbalanced, and the fear always, of course, is that you don't want that player to feel like you're singling them out and like trying to kill them. But that's why this is interesting, because Witchland are specifically Elvish Undead, so if you take the time to kind of weave this into the story and make sure your characters understand what's going on and what they're actually up against, whether through backstory stuff or through what happens in combat, or maybe even what the suggestion is to the elf, if that should work out that way, they should have an understanding of why this is happening. Not that it's just an arbitrary, I'm attacking this character because you're an elf, but these creatures exist, and because you're an elf, they're able to try to impose these effects on you. And ultimately, this is just going to come down to the style of DM that you are and the style of game that you run. Everyone might handle this creature in one way or another, and if you really don't like any of this stuff, you can just say that these abilities affect everyone, or just cut out the extra elvish stuff altogether if you really have an issue with it. But I think what makes this creature interesting is because it has these things that target a specific race because of what it is, it allows you to use that as a really interesting narrative tool. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but we're going to talk more about this when we get to our plot hook section. But I just wanted to make a point of saying that as we move forward, because the next thing that the Wishling can do is also elf specific. If it kills somebody who is an elf, that creature in a few days will turn into a witchling. Basically what happens here is that the body of that dead elf slowly starts to just kind of fade away, except for its hands and eyes. So if you have a player in your party who is an elf and that elf goes down and ends up dying in an encounter with a witchling, the party might be transporting their body and over the course of a couple days notice it's starting to like fade and hopefully they put two and two together before it's too late. But I also think that's a really interesting part of what this creature is and what it can do, because that's how it propagates its own species, for lack of a better term. The other thing we need to talk about too with this creature is its magical defenses. Drawing from kind of its elvish heritage and of course its undead nature, it has a lot of resistances to certain types of magic damage, as well as being put to sleep, charmed, that kind of thing. But the biggest thing here is that part of its armor class is due to the fact that it is semi-corporeal and most of its body is invisible. Meaning that if one of your PCs has true sight or some other similar ability or for whatever reason is able to see this creature, its armor class is effectively a little bit lower because it's easier to hit because you can actually see the whole thing instead of just its hands and eyes. This to me is really interesting because again it adds into that whole theme of the puzzle encounter, which the types of encounters I enjoy running 
being that there are things your players can do outside of normal combat spells that will make this encounter easier. So if they find a way to make this creature visible, either through preparation or just magic and spells, it's going to change this encounter completely because the creature will have a lower armor class and therefore will be much easier to hit. Another thing that just compounds this is whenever a Witchland drops a creature to zero hit points, it becomes visible just for one round. So in between the time it takes someone down and has a chance to act again, it is fully visible. So even those creatures who don't have true sight or whatever will be able to actually see the thing. Not only does that create a really interesting and dramatic moment in the middle of combat, potentially, where they can see this creature for what it truly is, it also creates a chance for your players to figure out that if they can manage to get rid of its invisibility or see the creature, they're going to have an easier time hitting it. Say they've been rolling 15s and 16s and missing, but then suddenly on the round it's visible, one of the players rolls a 15 and you declare that it's a hit. They're, of course, going to think, well, what's going on? Because players love to track the armor class of the monsters that they're currently fighting. But it gives them a chance to kind of figure that out, thus continuing to add to this puzzle that is within the encounter. So I think all of that stuff kind of speaks to good monster design. But one thing I felt this creature was missing was... Magic. It felt super strange to me that we had a creature literally described as being raised from evil magic using elves and it didn't have access to any spells. Uh, part of me think that's just because of the way that 2e creatures were kind of built. So for 5th edition, I figured we should give him some good old fashioned innate spell casting. So he's got a few low level options, which are essentially just ranged options like Ray of Frost, that kind of thing. Just cantrips that it can use that won't always come up because it's going to want to use its two hands if it can, but it gives it a little bit more utility. And also just from a flavor perspective, there's no way that an undead creature of this power level shouldn't be able to cast something like Ray of Frost or Chill Touch. I also gave it a couple uses of Magic Missile and Animate Dead, again, just because it plays into this theme of an undead powerful magic user would for sure know how to cast Magic Missile and it might be able to raise a few low level zombies as well, just to kind of add to the encounter a bit. And the very last thing I gave it was Misty Step that it can use once per day, which is essentially its bug out option if it gets into a situation where it's overwhelmed and wants to get out. But alternatively, you could use this in creative ways as almost like an assassination technique. It's a great way for a creature to get in really close without making itself known and then suddenly strike. Most of this creature's power comes from its two hand abilities anyway, but I just figured giving it access to some of these spells was more ribbon and thematic abilities than anything else. And speaking of thematic options, let's go ahead and talk about some thematic so let's just get this out of the way real quick. It's a powerful undead creature with regular level intelligence that can create other undead. Obviously, it's going to fit in perfectly in any undead horde or with in the entourage of any undead big bad evil guy like a necromancer or anything like that. I feel like it's not even worth getting super into that because all that stuff is so par for the course, but this just can be considered another cool undead with some neat abilities to add into your repertoire of undead creatures. Another thing that I think is really interesting about this creature that is briefly mentioned in the lore write-up section of its original entry in 2nd edition is that this creature is often used as an assassin, which again makes sense because it's able to affect the corporeal world much more directly than a ghost would be. And it's also going to be a lot sneakier and able to get into places that something like a white or another powerful undead wouldn't really be able to get into. So sending a Witchland as an assassin makes perfect sense to me. And while I always encourage mixing up the lore and changing things about a creature to fit in with whatever you want it to do in your game, I do really like the idea of these creatures being elf specific um, in terms of like where they come from and how their abilities work. Because if you have an elf or several elves in your current game, which is fairly likely, uh, you can use these creatures as a really interesting plot hook device, essentially. If you have any clerics or paladins or anyone who just has an inclination towards good and thwarting evil, it can be a great way for a member of your elvish clerics church to come to you and be like, look, we have this problem. There's a witchland infestation or a witchland has shown up and is raising dead from the graveyard. Like tons of different ways this could play out, but it just adds that element where it kind of puts responsibility on that player where it's like, yeah, undead attacking, whatever, but it's like, no, this is an elvish problem. You are an elvish cleric. 
who are coming to you and asking for your help specifically because you should know how to deal with this or it's at the very least our people's responsibility to deal with this. Or of course you could have a more evil aligned type of elvish interaction here or maybe you have a necromancer or just any near do well elf character in your party. I think a perfect example of this would be a warlock patron. So you have some kind of powerful entity who specifically deals and makes contracts with elves. And maybe this powerful being, it could be the one who created the original Curse of the Witchland. As part of that contract, when you die and it ends, you become a Witchland in service to this patron. Maybe that's not immediately apparent to the elves who go into this contract at the beginning, but it's sure as hell apparent to them by the end of it. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that anytime you have an enemy who is specifically designed, whether through mechanics or lore, to deal with or suppress some kind of other creature and you have those creatures in this case elves in your party it's a great opportunity to capitalize on that and kind of build plot hooks and really raise the stakes with your party members it's also possible that you don't use these creatures as kind of the subservient undead they're meant to be and maybe they have consciousness and wills of their own. In that case, you could have a Witchland appear to the party who's maybe an ancestor of an Elvish party member and isn't there to do harm, but rather as a helpful NPC. Or conversely, you could have a Witchland that actually raises themselves as up as a necromancer. Uh, perhaps they were a necromancer in their previous life and they kind of designed things to be this way and they are the big bad evil guy of a part of your campaign. And as I've said, you could abandon the elvish stuff and say maybe they're undead dwarves or undead tieflings, whatever, and the specific god of death for the race you choose, or even if you just stick with elves, has a more of a presence in your game. It could just be a well-known fact that Witchland exist, and when they arrive, it kind of heralds that the elvish god of death is doing something or doing some kind of work in the material plane, which is obviously never a good thing. Unless, of course, you happen to be one of his cultists, in which case that's a great thing. I do think one of the biggest strengths of this creature is the fact that it can be used as a super serious tool, because at first glance it might look kind of silly, but if you as a DM play it straight, eventually your players will realize that it is kind of a threat and a serious creature, but conversely, you can also kind of play it for laughs. If you're playing in a game that's not super serious or maybe you're doing a Halloween one shot or something, it can be an extremely goofy monster just because of how it looks. So the tone and how this creature is presented is going to absolutely impact how your players perceive it, which I think is really fascinating. In any case, if you like this creature and you want to use it in your game, the stat block is in the description below. There's a Google document there of the stat block that I've created and everything you need to run it is all just right there. And if you are one of my fantastic patrons out there, you can also get the kind of monster manual style fifth edition stat block from the Patreon page as well. Also, if you actually have ever had this creature used on you in the past, I'd love to hear about your experience with it, whether you thought it was kind of silly or if your DM played it straight and it ended up being something kind of terrifying. Uh, whatever the case was, definitely leave a comment and tell me all about that. Or if you happen to have plans to use this creature, I'd love to hear about that as well. In either case, though, I do just want to thank you guys all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And hopefully you found this video helpful, enjoyable. Hopefully you're now ready to deploy the dreaded hands and eyes against your players at a future date. But that is it for today's video. I will see you guys in the next one. Until then.